make some videos. Wish me luck. See y'all then. Welcome to Webworks. Welcome to the Library of Revolutionary History. Today, you're going to get a virtual tour from our events leading to the American Revolution collection. Document your answers to the questions as we progress through the tour in your library card. Events leading to the American Revolution. Resources provided by Lomans. British and French rivalry. Britain and France hated each other for centuries, fighting wars in Europe for years, and then competing for claims in North America when the New World was discovered. In North America, the two countries primarily argued over the Ohio River Valley. The Ohio River Valley was lush with vegetation, lumber, waterways, and lots of resources that both countries felt were valuable. Most of the Native Americans during this conflict sided with the French because the French were more respectful to the natives. They also just wanted to trade primarily in furs and conducting trade with the natives um, in terms of knowledge and resources. However, the British wanted to take the land from the natives. And despite this, some natives chose to fight with the British. The colonists take action. Under the lead of 21-year-old George Washington, 150 colonists fought in a small battle with the French near the Ohio River, but were defeated. Benjamin Franklin suggested the colonies join together under the Albany Plan of Union so they could be stronger against the French. In this image, Join or Die, one of America's first political cartoons, we see that this snake is segmented into pieces. Each piece is meant to represent a colony. If they are to come together, they are forced to be reckoned with. If they are torn apart, they will die. This image is George Washington when he was um, in charge of the fleet for the British during the conflict of the French and Indian War. Time for some questions. Why did Benjamin Franklin want the colonies to work together? And why do you think George Washington volunteered to lead a group of soldiers to fight against the French? Be sure to record your answers in your library card. The French and Indian War. In 1756, Britain officially declared war on France and her allies. Although the British lost a majority of their forts at the beginning of the war, the tide turned whenever William Pitt took charge. Pitt decided that Britain would pay for the war no matter the cost, and after the war, make the colonists pay their fair share. In this map, you can see that the British colonists are kind of concentrated on the coast, and then you have those disputed claims there um, where the Appalachian Mountains lie. France and the natives there to the north, and you can also see some important battles that have occurred in the wake of the French and Indian War. The end of the war. After the British captured the cities of Quebec and Montreal, France surrendered. France signed the Treaty of Paris of 1763 and gave the Ohio River, River Valley to the British. King George III, however, issued a pro the Proclamation of 1763 that did not allow the colonists to cross the Appalachian Mountains. There are several reasons why he did this. One of the primary reasons is because if the colonies were concentrated at the coast, it would be easier to manage 
he would be able to send his troops there and it would cost less money because there wouldn't be transportation across land. They could rely on the coast and the waterways and harbors so that they could keep tabs on the colonies. In addition to that, it was a way for them to continue trading and to prevent attacks from the French or the Native Americans. The effects of the French and Indian War. After the French and Indian War, the British were in huge amounts of debt and needed money. The British decided to pass more taxes on the colonists and punish the colonists who smuggled goods. In 1767, King George III issued the Writs of Assistance, which allowed British officers to search any location for smuggled goods. The colonists began to greatly dislike the British. Don't forget the concept of salutary neglect because the king and Britain were so far away across the ocean, it took a long time for them to relay messages or to communicate with the colonists. Because of this, the colonies learned to govern themselves, that idea of self-government. And when they developed this idea and then all of a sudden the king is trying to enforce taxes and parliament is trying to pass all of these new acts, uh, the colonists become frustrated because up until that point, they had been kind of allowed to do what they wanted. And now those things are starting to change. British taxes. In 1763, the Sugar Act was passed. Ironically, it did actually lower a tax on sugar. However, it wasn't just sugar that was involved. Other items such as wine and coffee were also taxed throughout this process. And again, it angers the colonists because it's providing more opportunities for them to be angry with the British over not being represented and still being taxed. In 1765, the Stamp Act placed a tax on all paper goods in the colonies. As a response to all of these things that were happening, a group of colonists came together to form a Congress and they went before Parliament to discuss the taxes and to request that they have an opportunity to have representation on Parliament so that they could make decisions for themselves. In response, in 1766, Parliament passes the Declaratory Act, which said that Parliament had the right to tax the colonists if they wanted without their consent. Adding further fuel to the fire in 1767, the Townsend Act taxed glass, tea, paper, and lead. All of these events are creating fever in New England and they're frustrated and they are wanting to rebel against the king. So one of the ways that they rebelled is by smuggling. If you can hide the goods, then the goods wouldn't be taxed. However, due to the writs of assistance, soldiers could come onto any vessel or into any home or into any business and search for smuggled goods. The colonists' reaction. The colonists were furious with these taxes because they were being taxed without having any vote in the British government, AKA parliament. The colonists rally cry was no taxation without representation. And they believed in the consent of the governed. This essentially was created by the man that you see pictured here, which is Sam Adams. And he formed a group called the Sons of Liberty in Boston to protest the taxes by boycotting British goods. So boycotting just means that you refuse to buy. And if you refuse to buy, then that means whoever's selling it is not making a profit. Let's answer some questions. Who formed the Boston Sons of Liberty? And why were the colonists so upset about being taxed by the British? Answer the questions in your library card.
The Boston Massacre. In 1770, British troops and colonists in Boston, Massachusetts, got into a fight in which five colonists were killed. The event was engraved by Paul Revere and used as propaganda to get more colonists to hate the British. This is the original engraving by Paul Revere that you see pictured here. And this was, again, propaganda, which just means that it is outrageous news that is meant to incite a reaction in the people. So what he was trying to do was really show the brutality of the British soldiers in this image. Crispus Attucks, which you see on the left, was the first of the five colonists to be killed and Crispus Attucks has become a symbol of the Boston Massacre. The Committee of Correspondence. The Committee of Correspondence was a group dedicated to informing the other colonies about the Boston Massacre and other events. Mercy Otis Warren wrote many pieces of propaganda against the British. Abigail Adams also wrote for the Patriot, for, for the Patriot cause and for women's rights. The Boston Tea Party. In 1773, to protest the Tea Act, Sam Adams and the Sons of Liberty dumped over a million dollars worth of British tea into Boston Harbor. Civil disobedience is protesting peacefully to make a point. King George III was furious and passed the Coercive Acts, also known as the Intolerable Acts, which closed Boston Harbor until the colonists paid back the money for the tea. The King also forced the colonists to house or quarter British redcoats in their homes. Let's answer a couple more questions. Why did the colonists throw British tea into Boston Harbor? And what law did King George III pass in response to the Boston Tea Party? Record your answers in your library card. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe.